the treads. Tank treads froze to the ground. I don't think anyone bled to death. The blood froze as soon as it hit the surface. But we strictly weren't prepared for that bitter a winter. Here we were just out of a war about five years. And we're starting over again in another one. Flew all my marine missions in support of the troops, uh, close air support along the front lines, napalm, close support with bombs, rockets. In three years' time, we lost 53,000 Americans out there. It was called a police action, of course, but it was, uh, for those involved, it was a, a bloody, bloody war. The fighting in the Korean War was as ferocious as any seen in World War II. But when the veterans came home, the reception they got was quite different. In Korea, you went for 12 or 13 months. And at the end of your tour, you were sent home. There were no bands to meet them, no uh, parades or anything like this. The way the American people treated the Korean War and the returning veterans, I think it could be termed the Forgotten War. I think most Americans did not see the Korean War as a personal threat to themselves and their families. Would it affect the person in the Midwest someplace in their home and their children? No, it probably would have very little impact on them. So I don't think most Americans saw it as, as being as important as uh, as World War II had certainly been, and so they didn't pay that much attention to it. But Americans were forced to pay attention to a communist scare closer to home. In 1950, the fear that communists were somehow undermining America from within began to gain ground. When Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were arrested for passing atomic secrets to the Soviets, it made it much easier for an obscure senator from Wisconsin to make some frightening allegations. Strike the word leftist, make that communist. Joseph McCarthy claimed that communists had infiltrated the highest levels of government. Again, we have a known associate and collaborator with communists and pro-communists, a man high in the State Department. Well, it was a very uneasy time. McCarthy on the rise, claiming that there were spies everywhere, communists everywhere. And of course, it turns out there were spies everywhere. They were stealing atomic secrets. There was fear, there was uncertainty, insecurity. Images of communists as evil and threatening were everywhere. The most successful popular writer of that era, and I mean astonishingly popular, was a writer named Mickey Spillane, and he had started out with sort of traditional police detective, short, punchy, Hemingway-esque sentences, tough guys. The bullets made little curries when they went in and turned into commas as the blood welled out. I looked at her. She was taking off her clothes. Oh, Mike, I really want you. She walked toward me, her hips waving a happy hello. And with the coming of the Red Scare, he switched it over to knocking out commie heels. I looked at him, and I could tell he was a rotten commie heel. Whatever the public wants, you're playing up to their appetite. But what you try to do is establish that appetite for it, and then you supply it. He hit the virus. The vi he took that virus and put it right into his books, which was a very good uh, litmus paper of how much it worked and how nervous the country was. Nowhere was the fear more damaging than in Hollywood. went to the movies all the time, everybody did, and we, we got a lot of what we felt about our country and about right and wrong and uh, being a good American or being honest or courageous from the movies. With so much publicity about America's dream factory coming under the influence of communist agents, the House Committee on Un-American Activities had a target. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic principles of Americanism. That's not the question. 
question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I am framing my answer in the only way in which... Any stand away from the stand. From, ...for Americanism for many years, and I Stand shall away from the stand. ...for the Bill of Rights... Which of the Hundreds of witnesses were called to testify on communist influence in Hollywood. They were asked not only to account for their own political activities, but to inform on their friends. There will be no demonstration. It was scary. It was very, very scary. And I was 19, and I took the fifth in front of the committee. Being an informer and placing your fellow actor, or fellow friend, fellow director in jeopardy, meant that that family didn't work anymore. So that taking that step was about the worst thing that you could do to anybody. The studios kept lists of so-called political undesirables and refused to hire them. They had the black list, the gray list, the if list, the maybe list, uh, the they know who list. I mean, it, it, was, uh, it was unbelievable. At the height of the Red Scare, a rumor on the streets or a mention in the gossip columns could close down a career. Lives were ruined, people were driven to suicide, people were driven out of the country. Uh, I think the results in this town were really devastating. Lee Grant won an Oscar nomination in 1951, but then after speaking out at a funeral of a friend who she said had been hounded, she was blacklisted. I mean, I, I remember, you know, like the, the floor just rushing out from under me and my heart going down. It's like, that's it. You know, that's it. Ms. Grant didn't work in Hollywood again for 14 years. Army veteran Carl Reiner was working on Broadway. Somebody actually came to my house, an FBI guy, and said, do you know if there are any communists in, the, in show business? And I said, oh, there must be. There must be lots of them because they're all over the place. Do you know who they are? No. I said, you guys, FBI, you find them. You know, I, mean, I don't know who they are. <laughs> They're not going to tell me. I mean, I was being funny, but I was also scared shitless. I am not a communist and never have been a communist. Between 1947 and 1952, the loyalty of three million Americans was investigated by the FBI. I am not and never have been a communist. People from all walks of life were called before congressional committees, baseball heroes, union leaders, school teachers, diplomats. I am not and never have been a member of the Communist Party. In an atmosphere of suspicion, the Cold War set Americans against Americans. On the battlefront, it was frustrating and confusing because it asked the military not to defeat the enemy but to contain him. The concept of total victory was now overshadowed by the specter of nuclear annihilation. For Americans so accustomed to the clarity of goals in World War II, this kind of war was rather baffling. By 1951, the war in Korea had become a bloody stalemate. The commander of the UN forces, the imperious World War II hero General Douglas MacArthur, virtually demanded a free hand to go after the Chinese. MacArthur's supposed to have wanted to have used 50 atomic bombs against Korea, North Korea, and China, and to have laid down a permanent radioactive belt along the Yalu River. But President Truman would not use the bomb again, and after MacArthur criticized the president and lobbied on to expand the war into China, Truman terminated the general's command and fired him for insubordination. On April the 20th, 1951, MacArthur addressed a joint session of Congress. I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. MacArthur's credo of total victory had been rendered obsolete by the new technology of mutual terror. Total victory now might mean total annihilation. In November of 1952, America tested the hydrogen bomb. 
1,000 times more powerful than the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima. To develop the hydrogen bomb, scientists created a new and highly advanced calculator. They named it the Mathematical Analyzer, Numerical Integrator, and Computer. They called it by its acronym, MANIAC. There was a World War II hero at the top of the Republican ticket in 1952. Not MacArthur, but Dwight David Eisenhower. I accept your summons. I will lead this crusade. Eisenhower, who had led the Allied invasion of Europe, promised to bring peace to Korea and to quiet the shouting at home. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I, I like I, everybody likes I. General Eisenhower was the first presidential candidate to use television advertising. By 1952, television was becoming an enormous part of our political lives. I own a 1950 Oldsmobile car. Vice presidential candidate Richard Nixon was the first to use television in another way. He wanted to deny charges that he'd taken improper political gifts. The only gift he'd accepted with the story was a dog named Checkers. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. Richard Nixon kept his place on the Republican ticket, and a lot of people thought television made the difference. <laughs> television was also becoming a major force in American social life. It's supposed to be tight! One of the country's favorite shows was this one. Your show of shows starring Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca. It was a family event. And a hush came over the house when your show of shows came on. Everybody gathered around the set. It lightened our lives. A marvelous diversion. The Caesar Hours were created by a group of unknown writers, Woody Allen, Mel Brooks, Neil Simon, Carl Reiner. We knew we were doing something special. We all knew it. We all knew it. Television was the buzz in the streets. It seemed that everybody was watching television. My secretary came in and said, Mr. Caesar, Dr. Einstein wants to talk to you. I was so shocked, I almost dropped the phone. Einstein wants to talk to me. Einstein uh, loved your show of shows, but um, it was hard to me imagine. I mean, I thought he was busy on the blackboard all day, never had time to watch television. I'm going to talk to Einstein. <laughs> what am I going to say to him? <laughs> you know, when you made that trek there, I don't think it was EMC Square. It was EM Square to the Omdra 18 power, not from the Omdra Shir. When that pressure escaped, it thrust the object forward, see? Oh, what do you mean? Like, the man, whose name was synonymous with brain power, had become just another television viewer. <laughs> As the century moved into its second half, television's influence over our lives would become more profound than even a genius could have imagined. <clears throat> America seemed to live in television land during much of the 1950s, but there were real locations in the headlines. Little Rock, and Korea. We'll look at the 50s on the next episode of The Century, America's Time. Thank you for joining us. I'm Peter Jennings.